Hi to everybody and thanks to you all for joining us this evening. Let's go ahead and get our webinar started. My name is Amy Holmes and I will be your moderator this evening and I'm also the outreach coordinator here at Beacon, the Behavioral Health Education Center of Nebraska. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization and just do a few housekeeping uh, agenda items and then we'll go ahead and get started with our presenter Cindy Hayes. For those of you that have joined us for the first two parts in this six-part webinar series, you probably know a little bit about Beacon already. But I wanted to give you some links here so that you can learn more about our organization and more about what we have to offer. We have a lot of training that's available for free, and you can check that out on our website. Um, the majority of our training is also available uh, for continuing education hours, so I encourage you to take a look at that. And then if you wouldn't mind um, checking us out on Facebook and liking us there, um, our communications coordinator keeps uh, the Facebook page updated with all kinds of great stuff, so I encourage you to check that out too. As I mentioned, this is a six-part series. This is actually the third installment. Uh, we have two webinars that have already been completed in this series, and they're available on our website. You can watch those at any time now and still get the continuing education credits. I have a link there on the screen you can click on if you want to check those out. And also, you should have in your gray um, toolbar that's up on your screen now, you should have access to a document um, in PDF format called Nursing Webinar Series Schedule. And if you can access that, that's a flyer uh, that you can have and obviously distribute to anyone else you think may be interested that gives some details about the remaining um, webinars in this series. And if any of you cannot access that document in your gray toolbar, uh, shoot me a message here and I'll see if I can figure that out. That's a new feature that's available here, so we're using that for the first time. Um, while we're taking a look at your gray toolbar, um, if you can uh, note the areas there where you have the opportunity to ask questions or send chat messages, uh, those will go to me, uh, to Amy Holmes, and I will be handling those um, on behalf of the speaker and giving her information in the form of questions or feedback uh, as it comes in from you. She'll have a, a couple areas during her presentation that allow for some great interaction um, and some question and answer. Uh, and then we'll have some general question and answer time at the end of the presentation as well. If we don't get a chance to um, get to all of your questions or comments, I encourage you to submit them anyway, and we'll do our best to get to those via email um, after the conclusion of the presentation. We are also sponsoring um, this webinar series in partnership with the American Psychiatric Nurses Association, and I wanted to let you all know that they have a wonderful Nebraska chapter, and you can learn more about this um, on their website. Uh, their president, Cindy, or excuse me, uh, Connie Wallace, is a great person to work for and um, work with. She's been a wonderful partner on this webinar series, and I'm sure she would love to talk to any of you that are interested in joining. Uh, the professional organization. But with that, let's go ahead and um, turn things over to our presenter, Cindy Hayes. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about herself, uh, but we're really delighted and honored to have her um, here with us tonight and know that she's got a lot of great information to share with you. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Cindy. Thank you, Amy. I am really excited to be here. I have been a member of the APNA for a while now, and so when I was given the opportunity to come speak, I just jumped on it because I know Beacon has done an amazing job of putting these programs together. As Amy said, um, I'm a nurse practitioner. I work here in Kearney. I was a social worker for a number of years, and then I became a registered nurse in 1998, and I worked primarily in cardiology, uh, for most of my RN career, but then the last part of it, I worked more in holistic and complementary medicine, which was really great because I've been able to bring a lot of those practices into my nursing practice. I went on to become a family nurse practitioner in 2007, and then due to the high demand for uh, psychiatric mental health care at the college setting in which I work, my, my uh, supervisors actually asked me to go back to school and do my postmasters in psych mental health. 
and I did that and just absolutely fell in love with it. So I'm going to get to the slideshow and I'm not going to read you the objectives because they're really not in English and very easy to understand. But really what I'm hoping to do today is to help people get a little bit more of an idea of managing a patient where the case kind of unfolds a little bit at a time, where you're dealing with a patient that's educated and uh, needs a lot of time for research and information and definitely has their own ideas as to how they want the treatment to progress. The other piece that I think is really important is to remember at the onset that there's more than one way to treat a patient. So um, I have medications and therapies and practices and my own personality that kind of blend together when I work, but then other providers have their preferred medications, their own therapy styles and that type of thing. So I'm going to talk about this, this patient the way I manage the case, but with the understanding that somebody else, another provider, may have done it in a completely different way, which would not have been wrong at all. And then I also, I understand we have registered nurses and nurse practitioners, and then some with more of a psychiatric background than others, and I really think it's helpful for all of us to have a really good understanding or a, a basic knowledge of the medications that are used. So I, I will go into, into depth in that, but I'll try not to go too deep that um, it feels overwhelming for some. But I think you know, I, when I was working as a nurse, I wanted to understand what the medication was that I was handing out, what it was supposed to do, because it gave me a better idea of how it was supposed to work, when it was supposed to work. But I think it's important for us to all have a good understanding of how medications work, what your patients might be experiencing side effects to watch out for, and that type of thing. So I'll be going into that. I also, I, I, I'm not a therapist. I have the utmost admiration for therapists because they have skills and resources and practices that they bring into play that just amaze me. And I am always impressed at the way we can work together to treat our patients. So I do bring a little bit of the therapy into it, and um, I'll touch on that a little bit too. So to start with, um, we would have a what you would consider a traditional college student, 19-year-old female. So she's a, what you would consider a traditional student, and as I said, her, her Hispanic background and the cultural aspect of that does have a little bit of, of a factor to play in this. So she um, does not have insurance, which is, well, I see that about 15% of the patients that I work with. And she is here at school on a full full ride scholarship, which means she's got some academic pressures put on her to maintain a good GPA. And I did not have initial contact with her in my department. The counseling department did. And they said she was a little vague about her presentation, that she was wanting to find out a little bit more about herself. But it sounds like she had gone online and done some self-assessments and done some tools because she was concerned about bipolar disorder and generalized anxiety. And she had no history of um, psychiatric mental health care. So she started counseling back in February of 2013 and her primary complaint was the anxiety. She went through some grounding techniques with them which I absolutely love. Um, they do practices such as counting, um, a self-soothe kit which people will put in things like textures that will help them stay more in the present or candies or music, um, crossword puzzles. So she was using breathing techniques and some grounding techniques and was finding those to be pretty helpful as far as quieting down some of that anxiety. She did follow up with them and reported that she had gotten an MIP, a minor in possession, in March and had been placed on diversion. And this happened the first time that she ever drank. So she had to deal with that, deal with her family um, knowing about this as well. So I first saw her on May the 10th, which is on the next slide, and her presenting issue was that her counselor suggested that she come talk to me. They reported an ongoing issue with some depression, but she said that it hadn't really interfered with her ability to function. You know, obviously when we talk to patients, we ask them anything going on at that time that caused this, and she couldn't really identify any triggers or anything that had preempted the, the depression onset. 
and she said that it was pretty pervasive at that time and that on random times of day she would just have this anxiety show up and it was just this impending sense of doom without any specific um, focus for the anxiety. And during this time she was becoming more comfortable with the counselor, she was becoming more expressive of emotion, she had been very reserved initially. And she really felt that the talking with the counselors and using those grounding and relaxation techniques had helped quiet her anxiety, her study habits were better, she felt like she was communicating better with roommate, with uh, other classmates, with her family, and she had planned on terminating at her next session, which would have been May 1st. But the issue was we're coming close to the end of the semester, and that's an interesting thing about working in college health is our life is cut up into segments of when the students are here and not here sometimes. So on the first for her appointment for the counselor she left her journal there and asked the counselor to read it after she left prior to her last appointment when they were going to terminate and in her journal she disclosed to the counselor that she was hearing voices so if we go to the next slide we'll look a little bit about her social and family history small central Nebraska town parents still married oldest child interesting fact of the family financially struggling, struggling with something that we kind of kept in the back of our mind after we had this interview because her dad had been laid off several years ago and that had put a huge emotional hardship because mom didn't work either she stayed at home and so he had just gotten a new job they were going to be getting insurance so things were starting to look up again for them she states that Never had a really good relationship with her mom. There was always just a distance, but felt close to her dad, and that comes into play a little bit later, too. Undecided as to what she wanted to major in, which is not uncommon for incoming college freshmen either, and then had been working part-time during the school year and had in the past and was planning on in the future working uh, full-time in the summer at a locally gro local grocery store lived in the residence hall, had a good relationship with her roommate, um, did go home for most weekends, spent time with the family. Another interesting feature of this was her family had absolutely no awareness of her symptoms, of her previous depression, or that she was currently seeking treatment. So this is her freshman year, her grades were good, and um, we were coming to the end of the, the summer, or end of the semester, and she was gonna be going home soon. So next slide. Past medical history, normal development, no real standout. She did complain of daily headaches that she had had for a really, really long time. She had a history of some migraines, but um, those were really well managed with her. Um, she had a migraine medication and just used Tylenol or Ibuprofen as needed. Um, no uh, trauma, no significant past medical history, just the depression, the anxiety, no energy motivation, lack of focus and attention, and then the occasional anxiety, as we discussed before, but never had a panic attack with it. It was just that low level and noticing that just things weren't as, as enjoyable as they had been in the past. She was reporting difficulty functioning at school, putting off assignments, but she was still going to class and she um, was still maintaining her grades, which for us in this environment is huge. It's kind of a barometer for us to see how a student or a patient's doing. So if we go on and we look at the, the more of the symptoms in the HPI, no bipolar symptoms or mood swings. And this had been a concern of hers, but when we reviewed the questionnaire and the symptoms, there were really no patterns of that for her. Um, no OCD type of things, no eating disorders, no self-harm, very low self-esteem, and um, no irritability or violence, no hyperactivity. She did report a very remote history of suicidal thoughts back in high school and luckily she chose to disclose to her younger brother and he was horrified. He was so upset at the thought that she might do that that she told him that she would never do that and that was very helpful having that familial tie and that sense of responsibility in that it was very protective from her for her as we went through treatment and therapy over the, the progressive years. She denied any visual, religious, or olfactory hallucinations, though did say that sometimes things looked weird, like the walls would shift or it felt 
really disjointed and that she had this sense of dis detachment and depersonalization sometimes when it happened. She did report, however, ongoing auditory hallucinations and she hearing voices when no one was talking and this started the sophomore year in high school. When asked to reflect back a little bit, she couldn't tell if the depression or the voices came first and she reported three distinct male voices. The first two were present pretty much constantly and they would make negative comments to her and to each other about her, call her names, really beat her down as far as being stupid and ugly and fat and she had this diatribe going on in her head all the time. The one that I had great concerns about was the other one which was Pat and Pat would show up one or two times a week and he would tell her to kill herself or hurt other people. He would tell them to tell her to punch people or harm them in some way. And when asked how she managed these voices, she told us that she was just able to resist them. Sometimes they could she could ignore them that they were kind of a low hum, but sometimes they were stronger and they gave her more problems, but she did not feel like she was at any risk to harm herself or other people at the time. She had no reported abuse, physical, emotional, sexual abuse or trauma of any kind, moderate of caffeine use. She had had that one time when she drank and got the MIP and then after that she abstained from alcohol use, did report ongoing problems with insomnia, just could not fall asleep and was not really restful, restfully sleeping after that and no history of sexual activity. If we look at the family history, no significant medical history as far as the family goes and as is not surprising in many cultures and many families, she really didn't know anything about the mental his health history because they just don't talk about these things. But she did report that sometimes she questions whether her mom hears voices too because she sees herself talking to herself a lot and it seems like there's something else going on in the room that her mom's experiencing that nobody else is. I did a physical exam on, this, on the patient, which is nice having the dual certification because I can do that, and physical exam was completely normal. So if we go to the next screen, next screen, what I'd really like to do at this point is have you send us what do you think your differential diagnosis would be at this point? If you are familiar with the medications used to treat these types of things, what might you recommend for medications? Any other referrals or workup questions that you have? If you want to take just a minute or two and send them on, am on in, then Amy can relay them for us. And for those of you that may not have heard the instructions at the beginning, I apologize about the, the delay with the audio and the, the visual. Um, you can submit your comments and questions in your gray uh, toolbox that should be up on your screen right now. Um, you can do that via the question function or the chat function. We'll go ahead and give you a few minutes to submit those and answer the questions that are up on your screen now. And then I'll relay those to Cindy. Okay, uh, Cindy, why don't we go ahead and, and start with our first comment here from Catherine. Sure. Uh, she says, I uh, believe this could be schizophrenia and not really sure what medication to use. Okay. Super. Then we have uh, one from Teresa. Uh, her conjecture is bipolar with psychosis, schizophrenia, and also suspects drug use. Uh, Tawanda Mercer says major depression with psychotic features, bipolar disorder, depressed and she would consider trying Abilify. Do so you want to respond to those comments? Yeah, absolutely. And those are all uh, diagnoses that were on the differential list, absolutely. When you hear of somebody at that age reporting auditory hallucinations, you have to consider schizophrenia. And um, the average onset for schizophrenia is um, obviously in that age group, but it's 18 for men and 25 for women. And Obviously, when we prepare, prepare for um, presentations, we learn an awful lot. So I um, went back and I looked through the DSM-5 and, you know, even when I was working with her with the DSM-4, went back and looked through and she did not quite meet the criteria for schizophrenia because she had the hallucinations, but she did not have any delusions. She didn't have the disorganized speech or disorganized or catatonic behavior 
or any of the negative symptoms. So she, other than the auditory hallucinations and occasional depersonalization, she was social, she was functioning well as a college student, as an employee, had managed to mask this from her family and all of her friends all of these times. So at that point, the schizophrenia was not my primary diagnosis, but again, I pocketed that in, in my back pocket as one of my rule outs to hang on to. Bipolar with psychosis did come into play too. We didn't see any cyclical patterns with her depression. It was pretty much pervasive depression, but again, first meeting initial um, diagnoses, that went in the back pocket as a differential as well. And um, in talking with her and looking at her lifestyle, not didn't have a high suspicion for drug use, but you obviously have to keep that into consideration as well. So we did end up diagnosing her with a major depression with psychosis. And when you have that type of diagnosis, you do need to have them on an antidepressant and an antipsychotic. That's what's recommended. But my practice is to start one medication at a time. That way I have a better idea of what's helping, what's causing side effects, and that type of thing. So I did start her on Abilify. I love that medication. Um, before we talk a little bit more about the medication, um, we also did diagnose her with the insomnia, which we knew we were going to need to be managing. And um, because of her lack of insurance, I was not able to do a TSH and a free T4, and definitely thyroid issues I would uh, be concerned about as far as um, contributing to her symptoms. So we talked about doing that. She just couldn't afford it at that time, so we decided that that we would table until uh, she was uh, more financially stable. And she really didn't have any of the other physical symptoms of the thyroid problem at that time. I also um, recommended a neurological consult, but again, not able to do that because of finances. She was expecting to have insurance in a month, so I felt comfortable waiting for it. I encouraged her to talk to her parents about what was going on, and she flat out refused to do that. Um, she did want to resume counseling in the fall. She did not want to see a different counselor over the summer, um, which was the only thing we had available to her. Um, and as I'm sure most of you know, counseling plus medication when you're dealing with depression or um, most mental health issues, that's going to give you the best outcomes. So we did talk about goals for her, and she wanted the voices to go away, and she is willing to consider medications at this point, and she is willing to talk about the Abilify. And the reason I love the Abilify is it's in its unique category. There's, category. there's only a few medications like Abilify, and there's a new one that just came out, so I'm excited to find out a little bit more about that one. But it's a, it's a dopamine partial agonist, and I said I wouldn't go too deep into this stuff, but it's unique in that it doesn't fully block or affect complete, completely in the neurotransmitters. So what you get is more of a regulatory effect. It, can, it helps identify where you need more dopamine, where you need to close it off, and it helps regulate that flow, which means you have much less of a risk for the EPS symptoms, you have much less of an issue with the prolactin, so your, your more serious side effects can be minimized as far as that goes. You still do have to watch out for issues like the metabolic issues, diabetes, the cholesterol, those types of things but it's one of my favorites. And in this case, her lack of insurance actually served me well because Abilify can be very expensive, but because she did not have insurance and her family was undergoing financial hardship, I knew I'd be able to get it for her from the manufacturer. So what I did is I recommended that we start the Abilify, and at that point they still had the vouchers and um, I could get a two-week supply for her to try. And then I also started her on Trazodone, 50 milligrams at bedtime, to help with sleep. And we also reviewed a handout on um, sleep hygiene and sleep stimulus. And my plan was to start her on 5 milligrams. And she was willing to opt in and see me over the summer, which um, required her to pay $40. And that gave her access to me for the whole month. Did you have any other comments, Amy? I think that's it for this one. Okay.
so then I saw her back again on May the 15th and she had a lot of questions about Abilify. She had done research and if you if you are looking for a really good reference book for um, medications, one of my favorite go-to is Stephen Stahls and he's got a really in-depth one on the psychopharmacology but he has another nice one which is the prescriber's guide and I use that an awful lot I like it because I can just open it up and review the information with patients and it really helps them get a better understanding when we're sitting down and talking about medication choices so on the 17th she did decide to try the Abilify and we were going to start her on half of a five milligram for a week and just see how she tolerated it and she had decided that she was not going to tell her parents the trazodone was helping with sleep, but she felt like it was causing sinus symptoms and congestion, so she stopped. And we did complete the patient assistance application. Um, at that point, we did an AccuCheck as a baseline since we were going to be starting her on the um, atypical antipsychotic, and we're wanting to have a baseline for her metabol the speech today, her metabolism and the, the blood sugar in particular. We couldn't do the CMP or the metabolic panel again because of cost. So if you go to the next slide for one week follow up after that, that was May 21st. Uh, she came with her sister, her five year old sister, she was babysitting for her which did limit our ability to really talk about how things were going at that point. But she had started the, um, the Abilify at the half tab and had uh, some mild side effects at the beginning, which, oh, too far ahead, we're still in the one week. Um, so she had some initial nausea and dizziness, um, which is not uncommon when you start a medication like this. Um, had had headaches again still in the evenings and what we did was have her try taking some ibuprofen or Tylenol um, before it would come on about 8 o'clock so we could try and preempt that from happening. She did feel like her mood was a little lighter and having a little bit more energy and that's what I, another thing I like about the Abilify is it has a much faster onset than when you're working with say the serotonin medications where you've really got that buildup that has to happen so you do see a little bit more of a quick response with this type of medication and the lower doses up to probably about 10 or 15 do tend to be a little bit more activating too. No change in the voices which I really didn't expect at that point and sleep was still really consistent. Um, if we go on to her two-week follow-up she had another whole list of questions for me as to how we had come up with the, diagnos the diagnosis of the depression with the psychosis. And we had talked about trying um, another medication, or she had wanted to know why I hadn't been trying another medication because she read that the Abilify was used as an adjunctive as opposed to um, a solitary medication so we had to talk a little bit about my mental processes, how, how I chose that and what my plan was and taking a stepped approach to care which did reassure her. She um, was taking the half a tab, um, felt like the Abilify was making her sleepy but at the same time more energized. She said she just couldn't explain to me how that felt but she was drowsy but did feel more energetic but she liked it better at bedtime. Um, appetite was a bit decreased but eating more regularly and the headaches had stopped which was um, very helpful for her because that had been a big issue as far as just daily functioning. Um, mood had been a little bit better but noticing that it was backsliding and she did report that Phil and Paul, those were the two that just talked back and forth into her about saying negative things to her, were quieting down just a tiny little bit but Pat was just as present and that's the one who was telling her to kill herself or hurt other people. She also said that she hadn't mentioned this before, but she um, had had an ongoing problem with just random sounds showing up, um, like video games in the background or babies crying. She said that was just, you know, mildly annoying. It just didn't really give her a whole lot of trouble. And she asked again about medication for anxiety. She hadn't really revealed it to me before, even though she had talked to her counselor about it and having a lot of social anxiety, going into a large classroom setting, speaking in class, even sometimes at work when she had to interact with people she was a little bit anxious and um, she felt like she was having more of a pervasive worrying about schoolwork and things like that at this point too. Her neuro exam and her um, psych exam and all of that was in normal. 
limits, and then we decided to increase um, the Abilify to the full tablet. She said that she had been observing her mom a little bit more closely too and was really wondering if her mom might have some of those psychotic features too because she said sometimes she'd walk in on her and really felt like her mom was having a conversation with somebody but she was in a room by herself. So we went up to five milligrams on the Abilify and I ordered 10 milligram tablets from the manufacturer because that would give me a little bit room for cutting or increasing the dose if I needed to. So saw her back on June 17th for the next follow-up, and we're still in 2013 here. And I had received the medication a couple days before, and she was taking it early evening and really felt like that was a good time for her, noticing a pretty significant improvement in the two voices, but not the third. But again, no distress, no suicidal thoughts, no homicidal thoughts. Um, was still noticing the pervasive depressive symptoms. Um, sleep had been improved. Um, talking again about that mixed um, sensation with the medication. When she came into her visits, I wouldn't call her blunted, but there was a bit of a reserve to her. There were some times when she would be animated, but sometimes she would just be a little bit more closed. And on this visit, I noticed it even more so. She really was reserved and not opening up much as we talked. She had, however, talked with a friend about the depression, which was a huge breakthrough for her because she really hadn't shared with anybody what was going on and still was not comfortable with talking to her parents about it. She is continued interest in using um, counseling when the fall semester starts and she was really, really consistent about doing the practices that they talked with her about. She was journaling, she was doing the breathing, the relaxation, those techniques. And she um, completed her diversion for her MIP and was looking for a summer job. And our plan at that point was to continue to titrate the Abilify because we were seeing improvement in the voices, which were a huge, huge issue. And talking about looking at adding an SSRI at some point, so we decided we're going to wait the next two weeks, see how she responded to being on the 10 milligrams of the Abilify before we decided to um, make a choice at that point. So on June 26, I got a call from her. She wanted to know which SSRIs I would be considering if needed. And I told her that I would probably start her on citalopram. And the reason for that is um, when I looked at all the different SSRIs, there may be some that are a little bit better for anxiety, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, in a little bit. But the citalopram is usually pretty well tolerated with minimal side effects and it is good for depressive symptoms. So I thought that that was a good place for us to start. When I saw her back on Jul July 1st, she had researched the Selexar, the Citalopram, but again had questions about how it worked and how it would help. Um, had not gotten a summer job, was babysitting her sister, and did say that things were going very well at home. Noticing that the initial improvement that she had seen with the Abilify was really starting to wear off and things were starting to slip back to the way they were before. And um, her mood, the mood and the energy were her greatest concerns at that point. She really felt like she was managing the voices, um, sleeping but not feeling rested. Um, and as I mentioned, emoting kind of came and went, but she was definitely a lot more um, expressive that day and had been talking. Um, more about the anxiety and she stated that her dad was very unpredictable and she never knew when he was going to get mad and so this is again that case where you get little snippets revealed as the patient starts to feel more comfortable and willing to share information with you because initially she told me that she felt closest to dad but now we're getting a little glimpse into some anger issues and some unpredictability in the home and of a positive note, she was reporting that she's experiencing more emotions before. She had been just depressed and flat. And so helping her kind of go through that process of how to deal with this new emotional processing. And part of that cultural thing, too, she really felt like she was never really encouraged to be expressive at home. She was raised to be 
a good girl, listen to mom and dad, do what you're told, don't get upset, don't share feelings. And so this was a very, very new area for her. Um, if we go on to the next slide, we're looking at that diagnosis and treatment. So with that update, I'd be interested to know if you would change your differential diagnosis at this point. Any ideas or recommendations as far as medications or further workup and evaluation? We'll let you go ahead and submit those comments or questions. Give you a few minutes here to do that in your question box or chat box. While those are coming in, Cindy, did you want to go ahead and talk a little bit more about it? Sure. Um, what I can do at this point is maybe talk a little bit about the SSRIs and, and how, um, how different they are. When I first started practicing, practicing as a family um, NP, I really didn't understand the subtleties and the nuances that there are with the different SSRIs. I thought, okay, an antidepressant is an antidepressant, and I'd go with what's ever cheapest or whatever I had in the, um, the sample closet. But what I discovered um, in my, my psychopharmacology classes and doing research on my own too is even though they all fall in the same classification, they all do have subtle differences which make them some better than others for different diagnoses. Um, my, one of my favorites for anxiety and depression, especially if I have OCD, is the sertraline. I love that. Um, but I didn't choose it for her in this case because I tend to see more nausea with that. So I, she had already had a problem with the nausea with the, um, with the uh, Abilify, so I thought I'd stay away from that. The Paxil or the Paroxetine is fantastic for anxiety in combination with depression as well. That is um, a little bit more sedating because it impacts the histamine receptor, so I would use that more in someone who has insomnia, but I don't get to use it real often in my population because a lot of the times my college students are having to stay up until 2 or 3 o'clock at night to study or cram or that type of thing, so it's just not really um, effective in this environment. Prozac has an indication for panic disorder, but I do not like that for patients that have a high level of anxiety because it can be much more activating and energizing and can actually aggravate the anxiety at the beginning. I do like Lexapro for the anxiety or the escitalopram for anxiety in combination with depression, but that oftentimes costs a little bit more and I have somebody who's a self-pay, so I tended to stay away from that one with her. And then the Luvox, um, that really is just more for anxiety or OCD and I didn't feel that would be very applicable in this case. And so when, when I start these types of medications with patients, I have this full, long education process that I go through with them. I draw them a picture of the brain cells and the synapse and I talk to them about uh, serotonin and norepinephrine and the neurotransmitters and explain how the medications work and then we talk about the fact that um, there's a time that we're going to be waiting for this medication to work and that is so important for patients to know because one of the biggest reasons that patients that are going on these medicines for anxiety and depression will stop it is because it's not working or it's not helping. So I sit down and I explain to them, one to two weeks we're watching for side effects and tolerance and then I talk about the short-term transient side effects that we're looking for like nausea and dizziness and headaches and those types of things. And then that week three to four is when we're really going to start to see the effects of that particular medication at that dose. But it's really that four to six week time frame that we're going to lock in how that medication is going to work. So that's been a really important factor in my um, work uh, alongside the counselors here too is they know that. And so they're seeing the patients more frequently than I am. So they're able to go, oh, I know from talking to Cindy before that it's going to take a while. So are you tolerating it okay? Yep. Sounds like you're right where you want to be and just giving that, them that encouragement that the medication is going to take a while to, to go into effect. We do have a couple more comments here if you wanted to take them. Yeah, sure. From Cheryl, uh, she wondered about schizoaffective disorder. Uh, Teresa has commented that she still feels schizophrenia may be the diagnosis but would try 
the antidepressant to treat anxiety and depression. And Catherine um, wonders about, oh boy, S-E-R-T-R-A-L-I-N-E, I'm sorry. And don't, and, and don't see a lot of nausea, she says. See more anxiousness with Paxil use, she comments. And that goes back to the, there are so many more ways to do this than just mine. And, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that I talk to patients about is the fact that I can give the same medication to three different people and get three very different responses. I can have um, one patient hate it, makes them feel sick, worst medication I ever gave them in their life. I have another patient who loves it, it works great, and then another patient who says, I don't feel it at all. And... Um, I just I have seen in my practice more of the the nausea with it, but I I wouldn't argue with somebody who says they don't because it's so different. And like I said, I love the sertraline for the anxiety, so that definitely would have been an appropriate choice. And again, the schizoaffective and the schizophrenia, yes, those definitely are staying in the differentials because we're just knowing her and just learning about her and those little pieces are coming into play and then when I look at that the other thing I step back and I say okay I've got what kind of symptoms I've got voices and I've got depression and I've got anxiety so what do I need to do to treat those and they're in line whether my diagnosis is um, schizophrenia with major depression or it is um, major depression with psychosis rule out schizophrenia so definitely appropriate Any other comments on there, Amy? I think that'll do it for now. Okay. So I, I didn't change the diagnosis, but again, I still have those differentials in, in my back pocket. I asked her to try the trazodone at 25 just to see if that might help stabilize that sleep a little bit because I'm sure you all would agree that if you don't have someone sleeping well, their, their symptoms are just going to be so much worse, and that can cause so many problems too. So we're going to try the trazodone. And then starting her on the Celexa, we did talk about the importance of watching for manic behavior because if I start someone on a serotonin medication and they have a missed or an undiagnosed bipolar disorder, I do run the risk of triggering that manic behavior. So she understood that we were watching for that. Continued to encourage counseling. She was continuing to do her coping skills and the grounding skills. Still didn't have insurance, and I still really wanted to get that neuro eval and labs done. So when I saw her back on July 22nd, we were considering a change to the Zoloft or the sertraline if the anxiety didn't improve with the, um, with the citalopram. So she had been on the current medication for three weeks at that point. Pat, which is the voice that was telling her to kill herself or hurt others, was almost completely gone, which was very exciting for her. Because if you remember, she hadn't been without these voices probably for four years at this point. Um, and then Phil and Paul, the others, were quieting down as well. Noticing energy and mood were getting better, but the anxiety wasn't responding at all. Um, sleep had improved. Um, we reviewed the self-soothe strategies and uh, other strategies from counseling and that's one of the reasons I just love having a common health record. Our counseling office and healthcare office uh, share, uh, we don't share common space but we're a single department and so we can access each other's records, um, they can look and see what I'm doing, I can see what happened at the last visit and then we also do staffing every week which is so helpful. And then I asked her if she would call me with an update in a week because I wanted to see how the anxiety was going. And one of the things I talked about is um, earlier is that I don't do therapy, but I do try and bring um, some of it into play. And when you're dealing with the depression and the anxiety types of things, there's really three different types of therapies that you'll see people use. One is interpersonal therapy, which really looks at relationship issues and um, that would be roommate issues, family issues, boyfriend, husband, girlfriend, that type of thing and really working on solidifying um, healthy relationships in their lives. The other is the CBT or the cognitive behavioral therapy which is more designed to identify and change the dysfunctional thinking patterns and I like to employ this a lot. Um, I like to take a look at you know, where does this start? We've got this this world perception, we've got this schema that we live in, which 
determines how our thought processes go, how we think about and how we relate to things, which in turn drives the emotions and drives the behaviors. And I really like to see if we can step back and take a look at where this all starts so we can break that pattern and substitute the thoughts and really do some of the changing in that way. And then the other piece is more psychodynamic, and I don't use this as much because that, that does require more of the, the counseling or the therapy session because it's more of a free association looking for patterns in feelings and thoughts and relationships and those types of things. And our counselors tend to bring all of those into play. Uh, we also um, do the DBT, the dialectic behavioral therapy, which can be very helpful. And then um, I'm also a huge fan of the EMDR, the eye movement therapy, uh, when you have people that have had uh, trauma or abuse in the past too. So on July 30th, she called me and she did feel like the anxiety was getting a little bit better and Pat was completely gone which was wonderful not to have that voice in her head telling her to kill herself anymore and the other two were continuing to decrease but that meant about five times a day we decided to continue the current treatments at that point and she then um, had a counseling appointment and there was um, just more of the looking at this, the anxiety piece, the strategies, and those types of things. And then I saw her again on August the 28th, um, and the same day they did. Um, she was really wanting to push herself more to become more social and to um, interact more, be open more with people, which she hadn't been open to before either. Um, so she did not like the antidepressant and it wasn't helping with her mood anymore and felt like the anxiety was getting worse. Um, classes going well, living in a new place, good relationship with roommates, positive and upbeat, but at the same time we have these other things going on, seeing walls moving or feeling like she was sitting still in a chair looking at her arm and she wasn't moving but her arm was moving back and forth and they did the dissociative experiences scale with her and you can find this online if you're interested in looking it up if you're not familiar with what it is <clears throat> but it's a screening tool anyway only it's not diagnostic and it will give you an idea of whether there is a possibility of dissociation going on with your patient and there's 28 questions and the higher the score the more likely it is that the patient has a dissociative disorder but it's not diagnostic but if the score is greater than 45 there is less of a risk of a false positive. And for her, if we look at the next slide, her average score was 36%. So high enough that would be something that would be concerning, but not high enough that there was a, not a false positive risk. Um, the reason she scored so high was the voices in her head, spacing off while driving, feeling like she was looking at the world through a haze, missing out on conversations, not being able to remember if she did something. So we did sit down and look at the dissociative um, disorder criteria and she didn't meet it. So we'll go on to the next slide. I'm not going to stop and have everybody do the diagnosis and treatment at this point, but what I'll do is I'll just tell you what we did. Um, at this point, decided to DC the siltalopram. She just wasn't happy with it, and, and that was the thing um, with her and with, with some patients, not all of them, where they really, really do a lot of research, and they really do, you've got to negotiate therapy choices with them. You really have to get their buy-in. Some of them are like, I don't care, whatever. Some of them are flat out resistant. I don't want to do any medication. But she was one, I would call her a very informed customer. So we decided to get rid of the Celexa and try the Zoloft, or the, the Sertraline, at 50 milligrams, which is the starting dose. And I usually offer my patients the opportunity to try a half a dose or a half a tablet if they're scored for the first few days just to ease into it and try and minimize those initial side effects. Um, I didn't change her diagnosis at that point. Still really, really want the neuro and the thyroid labs to be done. 
she went and had counseling sessions the next two weeks, which would be um, in September, and she continues to report issues with feeling like her wa the walls or the arms were moving when they weren't. At those visits, so she had a positive affect, good eye contact, using her coping skills for the anxiety, was doing visualization and being able to describe her feelings, visualize them, and watch the negative feelings go away. On the 17th, she had counseling again, and she was processing with the counselors about the dissociative scale. And at that point, she said she really thought some of the issues more were just to her lack of mindfulness or focus and attention, not really a true dissociative um, type of behavior. But she did say that she still kind of felt like things were foggy for her, that just she was not outside of her own body, but just kind of set apart from things. She did notice that she was feeling a bit more energetic and productive, trying to be more social, and um, was not having the issues with procrastinating on her schoolwork anymore. So then I saw her back on the next slide for September 18th, and the voice that was telling her to kill herself was still gone, and um, she was still hearing from the other two. Um, symptoms were getting better, but more fatigue was being noticed. Um, sharing the same information with her counselor, um, but was still going out being social with friends and classmates, um, still feeling that foggy dreamlike sensation, and being more physically active as part of a class requirement, but enjoying that, using her coping skills. And we did kind of a progress check at that point, and she really did feel very pleased with how things had been going. She had not been having any suicidal ideation, and at that point we decided that we were going to leave the Zoloft to 50 because she was tolerating that well and we were going to increase the Abilify to 15, hoping for more of that energy and management of the depressive symptoms at that point. She went back and saw counseling again um, end of September and beginning of October and her again her reports to the therapist were the same as what she was reporting to me. Then I saw her again in October for a follow-up, and she said that initially with that increase in the Abilify, she did feel like that did give her a boost in the mood and the energy, but that kind of started to slide off again. The sleeping issue was coming back into play, and then we have to also take into consideration the timing of this. The, the, October is when we start to hit crunch time on a college campus, and we have midterms, and a lot of papers due, and a lot of assignments, and she was under a lot of stress too, but still doing very well in her classes. And she was noticing that the voices are um, perking back up and giving her more problems. She did not like the trazodone even at the 25, so I decided I was just going to go back to something more natural that she'd feel comfortable with, and oftentimes in that case I'll use melatonin. And so I have people take three milligrams and they can take one or two tabs at bedtime. We reviewed the breathing techniques that she could use to help sleep and then I also showed her the progressive muscle relaxation too. On October the 15th, she saw the counselor and she's reporting she's still very wakeful, thinks that she's waking about five times a night. Um, Things at school are still going well, but she's struggling with that energy and that motivation. Um, eating only once a day, and we never really did figure out where this came from because she didn't have any um, history of eating disorders or eating issues, but she was down to just once a day and not a full meal, and she was drinking an awful lot of coffee. So working with the counselor, they talked about the importance of the health habits as far as helping with mood and energy too. So they, and she was open to this, to sit down and make sure she was eating more regular meals, getting that exercise to help boost the mood and um, help with the sleep issues. And then um, re-emphasized the, uh, the sleep hygiene um, methods with her too. And we did check um, on the next visit, when I saw her on the 21st, we checked her weight and she had lost seven pounds from February. And she would not really be classified as overweight when I started working with her. And the seven pound weight loss, she was still in a healthy weight range, but 
didn't want to see any more weight loss at that point. She was not a big fan of the sertraline at this point. She felt like it was making it worse. And that was a hard thing too, is working with her and talking about instead of just throwing away that antidepressant and jumping to another unknown, trying to increase the dose to see if that would help it. She didn't want to do that. Friends have commented to her that she doesn't seem like herself, even the one who knew that she was taking the medication. Mood was starting to slip, but she was making the effort to eat more regularly, and she did notice a little bit of an improvement in her sleep. So if we go to the next page, um, I would like to hear your thoughts again. Go ahead and enter those in the question section of your toolbar if you can. We'll give you just a couple minutes to do that. And while people do that, Amy, um, I, I'll talk a little bit about the sleep um, hygiene and the sleep stimulus. I mentioned that I worked um, holistic care for a while, and I, you know, obviously as a nurse practitioner, I believe strongly in medications, but I also believe very strongly in other uh, methods, like the melatonin versus a stronger sleep medication. But a number of years ago, I went to a presentation by a um, pulmonologist or yeah, it was a pulmonologist who talked about sleep stimulus in addition to sleep hygiene, which I'd never heard of before, which was fascinating. Because the sleep hygiene, the importance of having that bedtime routine and that quiet time to transition to a restful sleep and having those practices is huge. But when you have someone who has that chronic insomnia, you have to have something to break that pattern. And that's where sleep stimulus comes in. And the way I explain it to my patients it is, it's kind of like when you look at operant conditioning and Pavlov's dogs, that when you have someone who has chronic insomnia, their brain and their body associate getting into bed with lying there frustrated for hours because they can't sleep, and it just heightens the tension and the anxiety and the frustration, so it's counterproductive. So with the sleep stimulus, what you do is you have your patient do the sleep hygiene, quiet, relax, and get ready for bed. When they're drowsy, they get into bed, but if they're awake in 30 minutes, they get up which nobody ever wants to do, <laughs> but you get up and you have them go do something quiet and relaxing, listen to music, have a light snack, do some breathing um, exercises, and then when they're drowsy, they get back into bed and repeat as necessary. And if somebody wakes during the middle of the night and they can't fall back asleep, you have them get up and go do those relaxing things and only get back in bed when they're drowsy and sleepy. And it doesn't happen right away, but if you can break that conditioning and retrain the brain and the body to associate bed with sleep, you can eliminate that insomnia and oftentimes not need medication later. So I'll work with patients and have them do the sleep hygiene and then incorporate those those sleep stimulus practices as well. And I found it to be very effective if I can get them to get out of bed. <laughs> Audrey has commented um, that she would continue with the meds, but wonders about a possible eating disorder, uh, sleeping disorder, and depression. Absolutely, on all of those. Because, again, we've talked about the fact that this patient, in particular, is just kind of leaking information to us little by little. So we're definitely keeping in our minds, do we have an underlying sleep disorder or eating disorder? And so we'll be watching her vital signs a little bit more closely now that we know that. And then sleep disorder, absolutely. Um, I don't know if she has anything like a sleep apnea or restless legs or anything else like that that could be a physiologic cause for the insomnia. Again, that's why the, the neuro assessment is so important and I'm just still not able to get that. And the depression, absolutely, that's a huge factor. So, were there others? Yeah, I have two more, so I'm just going to, or three more, and I'll give them to you one at a time if, if that works for you. Sure, yeah. Uh, Catherine uh, says she questions if her symptom changes could be that she was entering a time of the year that brought back certain memories from home that stimulated less sleep or more voices. Uh, she's also entering a time of the holidays that may not have been good for her, may take a change in her meds uh, for that particular time frame. 
very good point. Absolutely. And at this point, I didn't know enough about her home life and her history. She hadn't disclosed those, but those are very good points, especially you know, if you're working with elderly or somebody who has experienced a significant loss or you know, those types of patterns. You definitely have to be cognizant of that, and a medication change would definitely be appropriate. Teresa comments, um, she wonders about working with peer support <clears throat> to help her normalize her situation and work uh, on creating a wrap plan? Yes, those are great ideas too. And we do have, we have peer health educators, we have um, disability services and those types of groups. Um, the issue with this was she was so reserved. We, we have group therapy here, things that people can do to connect with other people, but she was so close to the idea of disclosing the fact that she even shared with that one person was huge, but those would all be very, very helpful. I agree. Okay, and then from Gabriella, uh, wondering about major depression, um, but she continues to lean towards schizophrenia and wonders about the underlying eating disorder possibility. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we call this a complex patient because there were just so many layers and so many ways that we could have gone. Um, and that's why, I, again, I'm really, really grateful that I have the team that I have that I'm a part of because having the ability to, to see what they see and toss those, those possibilities and those differentials back and forth and I don't have a consulting physician out here. Um, even when the collaborative agreement was required, I wasn't able to find a psychiatrist who would collaborate out here with me. So I've had to pull from my network of other psych NPs and providers to get you know, consultation. And there are many times where I will call and go, okay, this is what I'm thinking. This is my plan. What do you think? So all of those are really valid points. What um, we did at that point was decided to DC de the Zoloft. She was not open to trying to increase the dose, as I mentioned before. And what I do when I change medications, I didn't mention this before, is I cross titrate. I know there are some providers that will just stop one medication and then start another one. And what I found with that is then I end up with a period of time where I don't have that serotonin or those neurotransmitters. I don't have those supported at all, and I have a greater potential for a mood crash or physical symptoms of withdrawal. So what I do is I cross titrate. I will start the patient on the lowest possible dose of the new medication as I titrate or drop them off the other one. And I've done this for my whole practice and it just worked very well. Um, I, you know, everybody would talk about the concern for serotonin syndrome, but I have never found that to be an issue. And I really feel like that tolerance and that lack of physical and um, mental, emotional symptoms, keeping that at bay has been very helpful with patient compliance. So I dropped, I kept her Zola for 50 for a week as I started her on effects or XR. I decided to go to the SNRI and add that norep norepinephrine component because of the fact that it's going to be a little bit more activating, a little bit more energizing, but I'm still going to get that serotonin effect. And um, if you don't have enough norepinephrine, that's kind of the transporter. It gets the serotonin to where it needs to go. So you can have somebody and you're just pushing that serotonin and it's just no matter how much you put them on, it's not going to be enough. So once I technically, quote unquote, failed on two SSRIs, I decided to go up to the next class. And I started her on 75 of that. And then a week after the Zoloft, I dropped her down to uh, 25 and then we stopped it the week later. And then um, I tried her on gabapentin for the sleep and anxiety. And this, my nurses joke that I'm like the queen of gabapentin because it's my favorite medication in the world. I work in a, with a population I, that I just don't really want to use the benzodiazepines. And I found out I really don't have to. And the gabapentin is a seizure medication, goes by Neurontin. It's also used for um, neuropathic pain. I love it for anxiety and for sleep. And it doesn't have, it's not habit forming, you don't have the addiction potential. It is a little bit sedating, so you do have to watch out for the sensitivity for that. But what I do is I prescribe 100 milligram capsules and I give them the ability to take anywhere from one to three of those capsules three times a day. And 
100 milligrams or 200 milligrams during the day is usually enough to just quiet down that overall anxiety without causing too much sedation. And then 200 or 300 milligram patient, or milligrams, depending on the patient, at nighttime will help quiet the brain down, make them a little bit drowsy, and help them sleep. And I absolutely love this medication. The other nice thing about gabapentin, it's got about a four to five hour duration of action. So it's going to wash out pretty quickly. They can use it as needed. And most of my patients tolerate it really well. I mean, I have had some that I use it, and they're like, yeah, it's done nothing for me. I just might as well just wave it over my head. And then I have others that 100 makes them too sleepy. I have another patient who takes 300 during the day, and it doesn't make her tired at all. But I really love it in my population especially where I do have to worry so much about abuse of medications and um, the addictive potential too. So then she went and saw her counselor on October the 22nd and was working on coping and processing and finding these practices just not to be as helpful as she had hoped. And so then they decided to go with the more traditional type of therapies as we had discussed, the CBT. Um, they were going to continue the weekly sessions and did notice that she was emoting more and has actually been a little bit more tearful when talking about what was going on with her. So then I saw her back on October the 30th for a follow-up, which was about nine days on the new medication, and she was feeling a little bit better. Um, she did, uh, like the gabapentin, was feeling a little bit of the response to the energy and the anxiety. And usually what I tell patients is, with the medications, that first two weeks is the watching for side effects, but at the end of that two weeks, they might notice a hint of a flavor of a little bit of a something of it kicking in. And she even, um, she had a conversation with a friend, and she was talking about the number of medications that she was on, and the friend was very concerned, even though patient was feeling better. So we had to spend quite a bit of time talking about how the medications were working, what they were doing, why we needed each of them, and she needed a lot of reassurance there. And then I, she saw the counselors again. One of the things that was a sticking point for us is we really just felt that there had to be something else going on behind the scenes that we weren't just hearing about from her. And they, they talked to her about history of trauma or abuse, and she... Um, she continued to deny it, and then, however, when she was asked if she would tell them, she said she didn't answer that, if she would tell. And then later on in the conversation, she said, well, she might not disclose something if there could be re repercussions, and she didn't want to get into anybody, anybody into trouble. So now we have this added layer of, is there some history of abuse in this family? She saw the counselor again on the... Next subsequent weeks, energy better, mood better, smiling. Um, she was eating more regularly, even though it was just two bowls of cereal a day, still denying abuse. Then I saw her back on the 20th. Mood was stable. Energy was better. Voices were negligible. The one that was talking about suicide was still gone. Sleep was still an issue, even though it was better with the gabapentin. She was still waking frequently during the night and was tired. At that point, eating two to three meals a day and uh, unable to uh, expose anything that could be a trigger for what was going on with her. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just going to jump in and um, tell you what we did at that point in the effort of saving some time here. Didn't change her diagnosis. At that point, she's taking Effexor 75 milligrams, Abilify 15 milligrams, and the Gabapentin PRN. I decided to continue the gabapentin as needed during the day for the anxiety, but I switched her over to the Seroquel, not the XR, just the immediate um, release Seroquel, 50 milligrams for sleep. I figured this is strong enough that it's going to help her sleep well, and at the same point I'm going to be getting that additive effect of having the atypical antipsychotic on board, which may help a little bit with the mood and a little bit with the other symptoms that she's having. Now, as I discussed before, the Abilify is unique in that it's a dopamine partial agonist. And so some people would look at me and go, are you crazy adding another antipsychotic? But the Seroquel works a little bit differently. It hits some of the same receptors, but some of them are different. It has subtle differences in the properties. 
And then it also is a histamine antagonist, which is why it's helpful for sleep. And again, low issues for the EPS and the prolactin risk. So I very commonly will use the Seroquel for sleep kind of like as my third medication of choice if I have someone who really is not sleeping well. And then, as I said, given her other symptoms, it just made sense to me to add that on board. So she saw the counselors again the next few weeks, and her goals were to kind of look at decreasing that anxiety and the voices still. She was noticing more and more concentration issues and then coping issues. And at this visit, on her last visit with the counselors on the 3rd of December, she brought up issues of blackouts, which had never been discussed before. So I saw her on the 16th, medications are helping mood and energy, getting better, the voices are quieter even though they're still present, and we're on the next slide. And then at that point she talks to me about these blackouts that have been happening since seventh grade. Started even before the voices did, occur about one to two times a week. They are observable to other people, but she has absolutely no recollection of what happens during them. And she said as far as she knows they last about five or ten seconds, even though she has said that sometimes they can go up to a few minutes. And that people tell her it's just like she just shuts down. She's not paying attention. She doesn't fall. She doesn't necessarily lose consciousness. She just becomes unaware. So at this point, we're wondering, are there petit mal seizures going on? And the interesting thing, too, is ever since these have started, there's been no change. They haven't gotten worse. They haven't increased in frequency. She uh, came back and saw the counselor on December 17th and then disclosed a little bit more information about the family. She said that she feels real close to dad, likes the attention she gets from her, from him. He, te he treats her more like um, an equal rather than a child. And then again, never felt close to mom. Her whole family lived with her uncle and his family until she was five years old and the ongoing issue in the past with financial problems that she slept in her parents' room until she was eight. Younger brother is still in there. And that she has always had a negative self-concept for herself. And the voices go right along with this. And she is doing an activity the counselors have given her, which is called 20, it's called um, 20 Positive Activities. And it's a list of 200, I'm sorry, 200 things that she can do to distract herself from the voices. So then I saw her in January of January 22nd, which is 2014. Mood and anxiety are good. Voices are still present, but she's coping. Um, feels like that energy and motivation are backsliding. She thinks the, backs, the, the blackouts are decreasing in frequency, but the most amazing thing is she now has insurance, but she doesn't know what her coverage is and if there's co-pays. She's still doing well in her classes. She's taking 15 credits, which is an average caseload living on campus. So I called her insurance. There was no co-pays. Made an appointment for her to see the neurologist on February the 20th, so a month out. I did increase her effects at that point to 150 to try and improve the energy issue. And then, excuse me, she continued her weekly counseling. Two voices were getting louder and more frequent. Her last visit with them um, at that point, her affect was very bland. She was quiet. When she saw them on February the 6th for her counseling, she had not told her parents yet about the neuro appointment. And they actually role-played um, different scenarios to help her figure out how to tell them. When she came in for counseling on the 18th, she chose as her um, activity for the day to do pros and cons assessment of keeping versus not keeping the neuro appointment. She had a lot of reasons to cancel, but her reason for keeping the appointment, which is knowing what was going on, she decided was more important. And she was still working a lot on the anxiety management. She called and canceled her February 24th appointment with me and her February 27th counseling appointment. I called the neurologist at that point and she had canceled her appointment. I emailed her and asked her to make a follow-up. I tried to be real open. I, you know, I was concerned about her feeling like I would be upset with her, angry, so I left it real light and real open, just asked her to make an appointment with me. 
in, uh, she didn't hear back from her, I emailed her again the following week. I included a note that her medications were in the office for her to pick up. I called her a few days later and left a message. And then I called her again the following week, which brings us into March, again, midterms and spring break. And I spoke with her at this point. She said she just forgot to make the appointment. And then with her schedule, she wasn't able to get in until after she had a business trip and then had spring break. She still had enough medication, so she wasn't going to run out. So I set an appointment for April 7th with her. She no-showed the appointment. So then I got a hold of her and we were scheduled for April 30th and she did come in. At that point she told me she had decided that she did not want to take her medications anymore and she had stopped them about two months ago. She said she felt like she was doing okay, mood was good, she still had some down days but not as bad as it had been before we started treatment. Voices hadn't changed at that point. Pat was gone, the other two were still mild and manageable, was sleeping well, eating regularly. She was also joining a sorority, which I thought was a very positive for her with the concerns about that social aspect and the self-esteem kind of tucked in the back of my mind. She also noted that she thinks the blackouts were occurring a little bit less often, maybe every few weeks. And we did talk about the concerns about stopping medications given what our diagnoses and our differential diagnoses were. And she did tell me that she felt comfortable coming back if anything changed. So we went in through summer break, the fall semester of 2014. I never heard anything from her. I'd see her on campus from time to time. And she'd smile, but um, no interaction or no calls. Um, in spring of 2015, she came into our clinic a few times for other illness issues. And then on March the 11th of 2015, she had a counseling appointment for the first time in quite a while for decreased motivation. She wasn't going to classes or doing any work, and she um, has concern for, for failure to make changes. She can make good goals, she can set them, but she's not really good with the follow-through. She continues to exercise and try those other practices. On March the 16th, she had counseling again, and she reported that she felt like a ghost or not really human. She said it was hard to explain, but she felt numb to all emotions, that the voices were there but not problematic, but she just kind of felt like she was a ghost walking around without any purpose at all. Then on April 20th, she had counseling again. She hadn't been to class for a whole month, zero motivation. She can identify strategies that she needs to do when in counseling, but zero implementation once she's out on her own. At this point, she does reveal that she started using marijuana at least once or twice a day to help cope, and she's tried to cut herself back on this, but has headaches if she tries to decrease the use. On the 28th, she rescheduled counseling to the 4th of May. It's the end of the semester, so we're getting really, really tight on, on helping her get connected and helped at this point. She didn't show up for that appointment. So then on July the 1st, I got an email from her. I was on vacation. I got an email, and she said she didn't know who else to turn to. She's gotten worse. She doesn't know what to do. She feels like she's in another person's body and can't really remember anything about her life. She says everything's faded. It's really vague like she never really lived it. The voices aren't stopping and now she hears new ones and sometimes she's having visual hallucinations now. So I replied by email and just affirmed her for contacting me. I asked her if she was having suicidal thoughts, did she feel unsafe, um, talked to her about how to connect with our psych hospital here in town if she felt like she needed to and told her that I could see her when I was back in the office in four days and then I also contacted our counselor on call, on call and had them reach out to her. And the counselor spoke with her and the patient said that she couldn't afford to opt in to see us over the summer. And the counselor referred her to a community agency that works on a sliding scale for counseling. Um, patient was denying any suicidal or homicidal ideation. And then I called her that first day. I was back in the office and she said she was hearing new voices, having a lot of depersonalization, which was even worse than before we started treatment. And she was planning to connect with a counselor, but still wasn't sure about starting on medication again. So we talked about medications and I talked again about how they work and how I really felt that that was going to be necessary for her to improve her symptoms. 
and she again couldn't opt in to see me so I referred her to a psych NP that works in the community and works with indigent patients and those without insurance and she said she would consider that but as far as I know she hasn't followed through on that so it was definitely a roller coaster with her and I'm so excited that the doors open and my expectation is that August 1st when our fall semester starts she's probably going to come in and see us I still have the diagnosis as major depression with psychosis because as the depressive symptoms went away I did see improvement with the, the psychotic features but at the same and at the same time if I sit down with the DSM-5 I do not have the criteria met for the schizophrenia but I would still consider that a rule out in my back pocket and that is all I have this is great information um, anyone can submit questions here in the chat box or in the question section of your grade toolbar. Also have here a link that we'll go ahead and put up um, that you can click on to complete your evaluation that you'll need to complete in order to get your um, continuing ed uh, credits for the webinar today. Let me go ahead and go to the questions here, Cindy. Um, Diane has been wondering here, and she commented a while ago about abuse, and um, this seems to be a concern uh, for a lot of people here that are commenting on the webinar. Yes, I agree, and that was the thing that the counselors and I kept coming back to is the onset and the symptoms she was having, the eating stuff, the low self-esteem, what the voices were saying, that family dynamic of being in the family room, living with the uncle, and she just never let us get close enough to really explore that anymore and my hope is that when the fall semester starts we'll be able to pick up there and that is definitely something that we consider it a huge red flag. Absolutely. And then how often um, do you come across a patient like this that requires um, so much input before you feel like you're really making progress? You know, it's it's really interesting because in the college setting, I would say over the last four or five years, I have definitely seen a huge increase in acuity and complexity of the patients that we work with. I mean, we still have the standard roommate, boyfriend, breakup, you know, family issues, those types of things, anxiety, eating disorders. But I think we're seeing a different demographic of people come into the college setting. We're seeing people who aren't as prepared for it who come from maybe a, a little bit more of a, a fragile background where they might have had issues and never gotten help. And this is the first opportunity on their own to reach out and explore those things. So I would say on any given year, I might have four or five patients that are pretty complicated. And then I know our counselors have even more that um, we have another nurse practitioner her, here. Her specialty is eating disorders. And so she tends to field more of them from that standpoint, but we're seeing a lot of veterans as well, so I have really had to um, learn a whole lot more about managing PTSD. It's, it's definitely not the old student health <laughs> from when uh, uh, people were kids a long time ago. And the listeners uh, obviously noted that uh, lack of coverage was a problem for this patient. And how do you see that impacting the ability of, of those that you serve, um, their ability to get treatment? You know, it's, it's interesting because it's really not a lack of coverage. It's limited um, financial resources for this student. A student can opt in to see us over the summer for $50. And so for a two and a half month period of time, that's pretty reasonable. And there's also free resources in the community for them. It's just, and sometimes they'll go right for them. You know, we'll transition patients off campus, back on campus. Not a huge deal. But when you have someone like this who's just so reluctant to disclose, it, it can be huge. But we do have quite the network set up, um, especially um, for summers when, you know, we're still here, so we'll see them. And then um, we work very closely very intently at transitioning students that are graduating or leaving the college to get them connected with other resources in the community so we don't have that lapse in care. Excellent. 
And what role do you think uh, stigma plays for those that you're serving? It sounds like this particular client um, was obviously very reluctant to disclose. Is that something that's common in the people that you're serving? Yeah, I usually tell patients that I know that I'm their last resort, that they don't come in my office doing cartwheels, yippee, because they need medications or they're having problems, that this isn't a way they've chosen. So we do normalize it, and I often talk to them about the fact that as far as I'm concerned, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, are as physiologic as high blood pressure and diabetes. And I explain to them that it's just like somebody who has diabetes type 2 and they're overweight and they're out of shape and they don't exercise and they eat a terrible diet and they smoke. So we start them on a medication and at the same time we help them learn to eat better and exercise and lose weight and take better care of themselves. And then a lot of the times we'll get to the point where they don't need that medication anymore. But it's not that they got dependent on the medication or addicted to the medication. Their body wasn't functioning properly and that's the same thing with depression and anxiety and schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. The body chemistry is not doing what it's supposed to and sometimes that helps and sometimes it doesn't but I do find a reluctance, a reluctance for them to share with other people what's going on with them. Sure. Very good. Well, I have a few more questions here that I'm going to uh, submit to you over email for response, Cindy, since yeah, we're running out of time. Sure. But this has been great, and we really appreciate it. We appreciate everyone's attention this evening, and we hope that you'll check out our upcoming webinars and be sure to let folks know that they can access a recorded version of this webinar soon.